<sighs> Welcome to the new year. You know, back in 2023, a big part of the year was all that AI crap going around. I wonder what people are using that for nowadays. Lame chat GPT AI won't let me mac on the elven women when it runs a campaign for me. What happened to good, immersive DMing? Elven women wouldn't know a good man when they see one these days. I give Leilani a gift that is a centipede in a box. I tell her that no matter what, I will always love her. Leilani looks at the box, her eyebrows furrowed in confusion and slight disgust. She takes steps back and looks at you, her expression one of disbelief. Human, what is this, she asks, her voice tinged with a hint of annoyance. Why would you bring such a creature as a gift? And what do you mean by saying he will always love me? Dude has an AI girlfriend and still couldn't make it work. Seriously though, I do think this is a joke post, but it is funny imagining all them incel types trying to get girlfriends through AI or video game companions and just flopping because being perpetually without game transcends into your entertainment experiences. I have done hours of research, looked up countless guides. At this point, rejection is just not impossible. This woman is my dream. She's programmed all of them. I just need to press the right button. No, I did that. So, let the romance begin. I say you'd better start looking for your true love because it's not me. What? I've been watching a bunch of your videos while folding laundry lately and just remembered a horror story that happened a couple months ago. I guess it's more of a what the heck story than a horror story, but I'll let you come to that decision. Pause. I swear, every time people say stuff like that, they're always leading into the most traumatic thing I've ever read. Point is, I think I know the conclusion I'm about to come to. For context, at the time, I was in my first ever Dungeons & Dragons campaign. We're all very good friends in real life, all of us beginners except for our dungeon master who is patient and a good teacher. The only problem is that due to some of us in the group working on the weekends and just the natural phenomena of being adults wanting to meet and play games together, we were only able to play D&D once a month. At the time, it seemed reasonable to me, but I inevitably began to fall in love with the game. I started needing to play more D&D. This game was becoming a huge hyperfixation for me, and I really wanted to play more. It was fun. I wanted to play different characters, try different campaigns, experience new stories. So my boyfriend, who is also in the group, came up with the idea to start looking for groups at the local game stores and on Reddit. I'm an introvert, and finding games with people I didn't know honestly felt really daunting to me, but I decided to put my big girl pants on and put myself out there. I became a member in various LFG subreddits, went out to my local game stores, and started applying for games. I filled out forums, I messaged a few people, and just when I was losing hope, I get it. A Reddit DM. Hey, good news! I just found my first Dungeons and Dragons game! Oh, that's awesome! Which find a dungeon master? I know you were having a lot of trouble. Did you go to your school club or something? No, no, I, I just looked on r slash LFG. I mean, it was so easy. You know, you've used LFG for like video games and D&D &D and stuff. Did you have a good time? I just, I'm worried. I, I just hope this is gonna be fun. r slash LFG led to the destruction of my What even killed you that time? It's your fault we're wiping. This is the worst dungeon master I've ever seen. Res me? Res me already! I waited like five hours for my LFG group to show up. Are you? Up. What's up with you? Are, are you okay? No, no, I think you're gonna have a great time. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'm just so excited. Oh, God. This was for posting on one of the LFG subreddits. I can't remember which one it was, but I remember that it was for some kind of 5th edition campaign with homebrew elements and that beginners were welcome. Oh, oh, do you, do you hear that? Do you hear that sound? It's a cow, because that's going to age like milk. The premise seemed interesting to me, so I had filled out a form and sent it in. I get a message from the dungeon master, and he tells me that he'd like to talk further on Discord to ask me more questions and get a feel for the character and what kind of player I was. Let me tell you, I was so excited. I knew there was a chance I wouldn't be chosen, but I was excited to just be considered. So fast forward to the interview, and I'm in a voice call with the dungeon master. We get introductions out of the way, and it started 
like a normal interview. Which kind of character I wanted to play, what my experience in D&D was, and what got me interested in the game, etc, etc, etc. And then, the conversation took a weird turn. Give me a sec, I'm getting all theater student on this one. Alright, got this girl from the LFG. She's in the interview. I'm so close now. I just need to not screw it up, and I can finally go on that date and prove my mom wrong. It's favorite. DM, you there? What? Oh, yeah, sorry. I just, uh... Phased out there for a second. That's all good. So anyway, how do you feel about romancing NPCs? Uh, what do you mean? Mind you, the question before this was literally, what got you interested in D&D in the first place? Like for example, would you flirt with NPCs or other player characters if your character felt like they needed to? I really don't know why I would feel the need to do that, but I actually do mind, and I'm not comfortable doing that here. Why? Okay, well, I mentioned earlier that I've only ever played D&D once with IRL friends that I've known for a long time, and we don't have any romantic subplots going on. So I'm trying to get a better handle on role-playing in general. I just don't feel comfortable role-playing romance with another person. Crap, crap, she's resistance. All right, all I gotta do is be a little smooth, and then I can convince her to romance with my NPCs. Then, Oh, but this will be a good experience for you. I'd make it very comfortable. Yeah, now the alarm bells are blaring in my head, and I have no intention of playing in this dude's campaign at all, but I wanted to find a way to exit the conversation with Grace. After all, in the moment, I didn't want to be rude, even if this guy was being a huge creep. I don't know, I guess I just froze? Well, I'm trying to figure out what to say to this. My boyfriend, who's in the kitchen, suddenly sneezes very loudly. Think dad in the morning type of sneeze. And because I'm in a room close to the kitchen with the door open, the sneeze, I guess, gets picked up on the mic. Oh, is there someone else in there with you? Yeah, sorry, that's that's my boyfriend. He has that dad sneeze, you know. <laughs> Your boyfriend. I'm sorry, I just don't think you'll be a good fit for my group. Oh, okay, have a good afternoon. Sure. Then he just disconnects the call. I was so baffled by his complete switch in demeanor. Did I really just need to let him know I had a boyfriend to get him to leave me alone? Like, he was being really creepy, but at least he left me alone when he found out I had a boyfriend. It just... It just felt so weird. I told my boyfriend what just happened, and we ended up having a good laugh about it. I checked my Discord afterwards, only to find out that the dungeon master just straight up blocked me. I hate to think about what this campaign would have ended up being if it ever ended up being a campaign, or if it was just bait to get girls to come in so he had a chance to flirt with them. On the bright side, I found a group maybe a couple days after that whole debacle, and we're currently two months into a campaign that meets weekly, and the group does not flirt with each other. Whatsoever. Alright, I gave the OP a little bit of crap at the beginning, but she is right. This is definitely a more mild story, mostly because nothing came of it. But getting harassed and flirted with over an LFG post is certainly not exactly the tamest situation that could happen in D&D, and certainly not ideal. Unfortunately, I will say that, especially for women, this is pretty dang common. If you've ever played any sort of multiplayer video game with voice chat, oh my god. For guys who play a lot of video games, they have zero game, let me tell you. But, you know, even if they did have game, it doesn't matter. People just want to play the dang game, whether it's a video game or it's tabletop. When people do this, it's not flirting, it's harassment. It sucks too, because I do advocate a lot for LFG, but at this point, I have so many LFG horror stories, both from you guys and from myself, both in tabletop and in online gaming, to the point where, can I even recommend it anymore? Is my stand switching? Am I now an LFG hater? I've made like five skits about it by this point. I don't know, but somehow, deep down, I definitely still believe. <laughs> We were six months into my 5th edition campaign with a few homebrew mechanics. Most of us did not know each other outside of Dungeons & Dragons. The Dungeon Master though took it pretty seriously. Every location had been built on Tailspire, so even though we met in person, we used on-screen maps. A technique I recommend! Though I have to ask, is Tailspire any good? Because I keep on hearing it's amazing, it's revolutionary, but I don't see anyone using it. Like at all. 
So is it intuitive? Is it easy to use? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, because of that, A, he railroaded slightly to stop us from going to places he hadn't built in advance, and B, he clearly spent a lot of time working on building maps outside sessions. The campaign was fine, otherwise. We had five players with pretty different playstyles, but we bundled along. Then, a week ago, a session ended with our players being asked by an NPC whether we wanted to accept a mission, before we had a chance to actually come to a decision. So the next day, the Dungeon Master WhatsApps us to ask us what our vote is. We've never played as a group on WhatsApp before, but we all start pitching in, giving our reasons for saying yes and no, and the DM quickly clarified that he wants in-character responses only. One player, we'll call him... <sighs> St Stigen? Stigen. We'll go with Stigen. Stigen says he wants to roll insight on an NPC about something. He rolls in D&D Beyond and gives his score on the WhatsApp and asks the DM what he intuits. The DM refuses though, re-emphasizing that he wants in-character responses only. Stigen then says he needs to know what his character thinks before giving an in-character response. The DM still refuses. There's a little back and forth and meanwhile a few of us give our responses offering a mix of in-character direct speech and also adding our reasons. Then the DM clearly gets impatient, adds a WhatsApp poll about what to do with four options. Yay, nay, yay, but let's talk rewards. And finally, I want to roll for history to see if my boot leather was acquired in a sustainable way. Wow, this dungeon master has the maturity and grace of a toddler. Of course, Nico. Same thing. Well, clearly a bunch of us picked comedy option four and not 30 minutes later, the DM said screw it and canceled. <laughs> Wow, my joke was not far off. He canceled the campaign entirely, citing a long list of grievances, including A, apparently shifting the campaign to WhatsApp and insisting that we roleplay in character without letting us discuss things or use mechanics like rolling insights is fine and valid, and not immediately falling in line is a bannable offense? B, picking the comedy option that he provided in a multiple choice poll, even temporarily, is actively sabotaging his campaign, and therefore also a bannable offense. And C, for bonus points, when one player, we'll call him Seamus, said their motivation on saying yes was to curry favor with person X in the hope of eventually getting help in recapturing place Y, this was nonsensical, because place Y doesn't exist anymore, despite the fact that Seamus' character had used the goal of recapturing place Y in every session as the rationale for every major decision and it had never been a problem before because it had never been mentioned before that place Y no longer existed? Well, the journey has been long but at last I'm returning home. My city will know salvation and I will destroy the dark threat at its heart. This quest has been a long time coming. But, but sir! No, no. I know what you're about to say. I know the doubts that plague your mind. The threats may be insurmountable, but our home needs to be saved. No, that is, that is not what I was about to say. The city has been destroyed. Wait, what? Yes, it was, it was destroyed many moons ago. That's impossible. I gaze longingly at the city from afar. There's no way it's just destroyed. There is no home for you to return to. It's been like this for a while, actually. Does it? DM! What? Yeah, a uh, player here. Why? How? What? The city was destroyed, okay? I just came up with this recently, all right? You're gonna need to adapt. Adapt? How am I supposed to adapt to this? This is like my, my whole backstory and motivation just erased. I mean, my character may as well not be here anymore. It's a plot. It's called a plot twist, obviously. A pl plot twist? I mean, you can't just do a plot twist out of nowhere with no no foreshadowing and no actual reveal. I mean, it's just an NPC randomly telling me. Are you kidding me? That's just so stupid. How am I even supposed to- Players are a dime a dozen these days. Anyway, what do you guys want to do next? All oh, right, I don't have any players anymore. Anyway, all that. Guess what? That's a bannable offense too. He continued, and indeed still continues, to claim that he's entirely in the right, and proof of the pudding is that we picked the option in the poll that he'd put in to test us, which feels like a 14-year-old passing notes in class level of insecurity. This dude is over 40 years old. So that's that. No more campaign. And I guess the hundreds of maps he's built on Tailspire will go into cold storage. Next time, we'll just not roll insight, I guess. 
what the DM is doing here is a piece of advice that friend of the channel Joe Cat gave on our Tavern Adjacent show. Wishing you the best, man. Joe Cat has the players vote on the decisions made in his campaigns to ensure that the most people are actually happy with what happens and that the story goes the direction favored by the group. This is not a bad piece of advice. In fact, it's a piece of advice that I use. Now, I don't use WhatsApp polls to do it. I prefer a level of more organic discussion because, you know, I like actually talking to my friends. However, even in this text-based method, I mean, you need to let the players discuss, and frankly, letting them roll insight is not that big of a deal. The DM having a freakout over that is, well, it's a bit of a red flag. The DM seems very insecure outside looking in perspective, and has an issue with control. I mean, I'm the same way, but when you're being a dungeon master, you gotta keep that control thing down, because a big part of the game is letting your players do their thing, and banning them from even rolling insight during an important discussion, it's gonna get them to really hate you. Not that the DM needed any more help with that. This will be the first time I write here, and it's not a very long story since the guy got booted after only two sessions, but I had to share this because it's still making me laugh. I joined the group through a D&D Discord server, and to my knowledge, none of the players or dungeon masters knew each other prior. The group consisted of one, the dungeon master, also a knight, a male fighter with just the knight background, rogue, a female tabaxi, cleric, a female dwarf, and then myself as the warlock. Meeting and speaking to the players went just fine, and I saw no real red flags going into this. This dungeon master had an interesting idea for how to ease the characters into his campaign. He aimed to host a smaller adventure first so everyone would get to know each other and how to work together through the big stuff, so we start with a simple dungeon crawl. It's explained that we are adventurers that came together, taking on this commission to stop some kobold necromancer from causing a ruckus. Knight is using the retainer background feature, so he is joined by three female attendants. <laughs> It'll be fine. One of which was a squire noble. Before we even set foot inside the dungeon, the knight is already trying to flirt with one of his retainers. They're handled as NPCs, so the dungeon master is controlling them and plays them as not receptive to his advances, so she turns him down. Knight does not seem happy with it, but he accepts the no. After a few battles with the undead, we are battered enough to warrant a short rest before going up against the boss of the dungeon. During the rest, the knight is added again and tries to flirt with the second retainer, but this time says things like, Remember, you're sworn to serve me in whatever way I want. This is a full service position. I don't have the, I have okay I have specific needs. The DM turns him down yet again and reminds him that the feature says they are free to leave and will if mistreated. Wait, it actually does? Huh. It actually does say that. Smack dab on page 136 straight up. I mean, I'm happy that it's there in the first place. I didn't expect that honestly. I thought it was just something that was added onto like the wiki dot. But at the same time, it's kind of sad that the developers needed to account for such behavior in the first place. Glad they did, but sad they had to. Knight still insists with, and I'm paraphrasing from memory, you are a low-born wench, so you will sleep with me if I tell you to. Well, the DM warns him. The retainer says, I cannot work under these conditions, and leaves, together with the first retainer, leaving him with just the squire. Knight whines about the loss because now his background feature is left at a third of its power, but eventually accepts the DM's ruling after he says, If you behave, you can hire other retainers when you return to your estate. We finish our rest, face the kobold necromancer, and slay it without much issue. Celebrations are had, and we divvy up some loot between us. It seems like a good spot to end the session, so we do, and talk about the adventure so far. Everyone is liking it, except the knight. He complains that you said sexual content is not off the table, and the DM defends his ruling with, well, you can't just bed anyone, and you can't just use harassment. Nobody's gonna like that. It's a very low energy bickering, but it seemed like the only takeaway knight had was that content like that is still game, and his squire booty is still valid. That was the takeaway. How? Look, man, I know that they're NPCs, but it's causing a lot of problems at the table. Y you can't keep on harassing your squires, okay? It's just straight up not good for the table. All right, romance is fine, but this harassment, it it's, it's got to stop with the squires, okay? So what you're saying is... I still have a shot with her, right? That's not even... Uh, that's not even remotely what I meant to say. Are you... Hey, are you listening? 
On comes session two, a week later, we continue where we left off last time and travel to the nearest city. It becomes apparent that Rogue and Cleric are starting to get something going on between them, and that they have been roleplaying between sessions. Their talk is more flirty. I guess that's all the encouragement Knight needs to finally try and get it on with his squire, but he comes off way too strong by saying stuff like this. Your duty includes polishing my spear. Uh, but you use a sword, the lord. I'm talking about the other spear. Wink. Obviously, this doesn't <laughs> go down all that well. And the squire says, I'm of noble blood. I don't have to take this crap from you. And storms off. The knight complains yet again. And the DM reminds him that he can't just talk to women like that if he wants success. What? But this women these book told me that's how it works. Come on, isn't that odd convincing? Knight responds by sighing really loudly and rolling with it, recruiting replacement retainers later. We decide to head to the tavern to get a drink and look for more commissions. I knew it was a really bad idea, but I wanted to see where this was going. There are tavern wenches, right? Yeah. I slap one of them on the butt as she walks by. <sighs> you slap her on the butt, she spins around and slaps you in the face. I guess that was finally the last drop. Even though it should have been obvious what was going to happen, Knight starts yelling about how it was unfair to the dwarf, got a hot cat girl waifu, but he constantly got shot down by the dungeon master and how the DM is signaling him out and giving him misleading info. <laughs> like what? The DM said, don't harass people. And they kept on harassing people. The DM offered truth. I think the guys didn't want to hear it. Anyway, he specifically yelled, and I quote, My character got the biggest set of blue balls. What do I do to get my... <laughs> Not reading that. At that point, the dungeon master just banned the guy from the server and kicked him out of the Roll20 campaign. It got less exciting with that guy gone, but I'm enjoying the group so far. We're still playing as a three-man with an eye out for a fourth player. To be honest, when the guy went full service position on his squires, I think that was the first and only step in getting rid of this guy. That kind of content is not okay. But hey, at the end of the day, this situation lasted two sessions and two sessions alone. In an age where some people on the internet think that pushing just the right buttons are gonna get them automatic love, where they think that video game romance mechanics apply to real life, these sore dudes are gonna be popping up. I mean, I joked about that womanese book, but how many similar tomes are out there encouraging men like this to push the right buttons and get the girl through what amounts to straight up harassment. Overall horrifying, but at the very least it was funny. I mean, the little bit at the end where he gets jealous of the lesbian couple. It was the exact kind of chuckle I needed. Our dungeon master's world building was homebrew, but the rules were pretty standard, and they did a great job helping us do character creation so that we would all have a good connection to the story. Session zero, we all were encouraged to make our characters work together. So no evil, no murder hoboing. And while we were all fine with dark subjects like violence, etc., we're steering clear of anything explicit. We were all really happy with what we came up with. There were four of us in the party, Bard, Warlock, Fighter, and a friend who was a reoccurring guest as a cleric when she was available. Fighter is the only male player. The rest of us were all women or NB. This was Fighter's first time playing and the Dungeon Master's first time DMing. The rest of us had at least a little experience with TTRPGs. For this, it's really only our fighter who is important. He brought a bandit leader character concept, who was very Robin Hood or Dread Pirate Roberts in tone. Basically a guy who does crime and is known for it, but it's either in service of the greater good or his reputation is far worse than reality. You know, that kind of thing. First session is fine. Fighter even lends the protection of his caravan slash crew to get us to our first destination. All of our characters are getting along well. We have to pause a couple weeks before session two due to life, and this triggers the first hint of a problem in Fighter that some of us might be familiar with, having too much downtime to think about your character. <sighs> a classic, having a character that starts off as a simple outlaw then evolves into the son of a demigod who's destined to fight against a great dragon with a tensely complex history and lore with various interconnected characters. Happens to the best of them. He comes to the dungeon master with some changes, casually telling them, Yeah, I think my character might have a little more blood on his hands, actually. Like, he's killed some folks. And the dungeon master responds with, well, yeah, naturally, it's probably going to happen when you're robbing military shipments or nobles with guards. It's their job to not let you take their stuff quietly. And Fighter responds with, no, 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 no. I mean, like, he and his bandits have attacked and robbed people for fun, like civilians, women, children. 
That kind of thing. Oh, okay. So less Atreus character evolution and more Arthur Morgan character D evolution. Interesting. The Dungeon Master is reluctant because this is not the vibe that was established when we first started. And Fighter clearly doesn't mean it as these are my character's past actions that he's but he's on a journey to repent. No, it's more like a thing he's actively doing. The Dungeon Master talks him down from this choice and gets him to rein it back in into the previous Robin Hood vibes because the Dungeon Master understandably doesn't want to have to ride around a tone change like that. Fighter is understanding and apologizes, no harm done, but this wasn't the only one of Fighter's attempts at redacting his backstory in favor of something more edgy. There are a few other cases that were dodged during the course of the game, and I'll just talk about the biggest one. His character's much older sister ran a brothel. No problems here. We support those workers in this house. And she has a lovely character played by the dungeon master as a great source of information. And her place has an excellent underground hideout for our party. She was extremely protective over the workers she employed and of her little brother, who she raised for a while after their parents died. Cleric, who had been a worker in the intimate world in her younger years, was very open about the experience. I was actually pleased to have some positive rep in the form of his NPC. After the session where we met her, we had another one of those breaks for a couple of weeks while we struggled with our work schedules. And it happened. Again. Fighter came to the Dungeon Master with another change to his backstory, saying that his character had probably also worked at the Cuddle Puddle before becoming a bandit. This is fine, but quickly gets weirder when he talks about his character working under his sister and being trained for the job by her. Yeah, his he wanted his character to have slept with his older sister multiple times. Wait, callous murder of the innocent? Randomly sleeping with your sister? <gasps> this guy wants to be season one Jamie Lannister! Yeah! Now the Dungeon Master lives with Warlock and I, and this is the first time we actually heard about Fighter and his ideas because the Dungeon Master came to us in kind of a panic and just started spilling everything they had been trying to keep under control behind the scenes with Fighter. They did not want to be in charge of playing the NPC who had groomed her younger brother for that kind of work and it put the whole motherly slash sweet relationship they had been playing her towards into a really skeevy gross context because Fighter implied he wanted the relationship with his sister to be like a an on again off again thing that was happening whenever he came back to visit her. Warlock, whose character had been two seconds away from entering a romance with his character, was horrified. What Fighter had probably intended to be a more consensual Lannister esque. I mean, it's still bad! The Lannister relationship was not something to be envied! This would naturally just have questionable factors at play with the pre established dynamics of the characters and the fact that his sister raised him. I am sure the Dungeon Master would like to say that scheduling was the majority of the reason this campaign actually fizzled out, but I know that this was the last straw. Even though the fighter was actually fine redacting this proposal, it had still put DM in a really bad mental spot, and it was best for all of us to just drop this. The worst part was, Fire didn't even see the problem with any of this content, or with the constant urge to rewrite his character's background. Fortunately, we did all wind up talking this out a lot later, and Fighter is still a very good friend of ours. He felt terrible afterwards, and it turns out a lot of the problem was just that he's an only child cis guy who had a pretty trauma-free life growing up, and didn't actually realize the potential IRL weight of a lot of these edgier things he wanted to work into his character's backstory. He's now a lot better about considering how his ideas might affect the rest of the players, and I'm glad, because he's a chill dude. This could have easily become incredibly creepy. Thankfully, he's never been even a little bit weird to any of us outside of game, and even back then, he was always very open to the Dungeon Master turning down his ideas. It just, understandably, got to be a bit too much for the Dungeon Master to always have to play editor when you went off the rails. Wow, a shockingly wholesome ending to this story. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it takes just a little bit of introspection to realize why people do these things. Fighter had a perfectly reasonable reason for why he was comfortable with these topics, and once he realized people were uncomfortable, he immediately pulled back. It's a shame the game had to die because of it, but it's good that these people are still friends. Everyone has their own perspective, their own stuff going on, and the fact that Fighter was able to learn that, realize that, and internalize that 
is a great sign. As for the actual D&D stuff, I don't think it's a huge problem if players want to retcon a character backstory, but you need to be careful. DMs often do a lot of planning during their campaigns and plan around the backstories you give them. If you want to shift things too much, it might get a little bit stressful for the dungeon master. However, I don't want to imply that character backstories need to be set in stone and never changing because that puts a lot of pressure on the players in turn. It's all about balance. As long as you're open with your dungeon master about the changes you want to make and more importantly why you want to make them, I don't think it should be a problem. These changes though, they might be a bit much for the vast majority of dungeon masters. Alright, that's a wrap on our first episode of 2024. Let me know what you think of the new music. It was an original composition that I commissioned from Autumn Orange, who makes all of the music you hear at Crispy's Tavern. Please do check out their work linked in the description down below. They are truly, truly incredible and apparently a fan of the channel, which was a nice surprise in terms of the video in general. If you guys enjoyed them, please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Tabletop Tavern Tip series, where we give advice both DMs and players, old and new, it's linked to the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out and Finally, from leaving your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. Got no game to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to me. There's an email down in the description down below. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories in S, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell. I found one of my cat ears on the ground. Oh, I was doing. Did it fall off while I was recording? Was it off the whole time? I'm not an e-girl anymore. I'm just a boy. Awful. <laughs>